Um, my name is Steve Brandt, and uh, it's an honor to get to talk to the three of you. Um, Mr. Friedman, at your MIT lecture that I got to watch on the internet for free, thank you, MIT, thank you. <laughs> you talked about this uh, terrorism problem, the 9-11 uh, mindset and the end of the Cold War mindset sort of in competition with each other. Yes. That's what I wanted to ask you about, because it's, you basically said it was optimism battling pessimism for what view of the future was going to dominate. And um, I am an engineer originally. Mm -hmm. And in Scientific America, Gerard Peel used to talk about the science of peace and uh, whether we really had enough technological ability to feed and clothe and house everyone on the planet. Because if we can't feed, clothe, and house everyone, then the root cause of war exists because it's not enough for everyone. Right. If we can feed, clothe, and house everyone, the root cause of war actually goes away. Except we don't ever seem to have talked about that, even though Gerard Peel apparently published in the early 60s about this. And so as an engineer, looking at globalization, knowing we have the science to have peace, because the Malthusian economics is now obsolete, um, how can we bring this scientific perspective yeah. into the mix and, and get right. to that you know, end. brilliant folks yeah. like you to, well. to, to look at this question of scarcity versus abundance right. as a physical reality? And Ted, maybe there's a Discovery Channel show on this. <laughs> Well, you know, um, I, and I'm e eager to hear what Joe has to say on this as well. I would say that it's why I ended the, the book with, uh, in a way, a very strange chapter. In some ways, it had nothing to do with technology. It's called imagination. Because um, what I basically argued is that, OK, if, if this flattening is going on, as I think it is, that more people are getting the tools to compete, connect, collaborate, innovate, then what really matters is what they imagine to do with them. And um, I argue that there were really two competing forms of imagination in the world. The imagination of 11-9, happens to be the day the Berlin Wall came down, November 9th, 1989, 11-9. And 9-11, the day the Twin Towers came down. And 11-9 was um, the product of a certain kind of imagination. Because what basically happened was somebody in the leadership in Hungary, we don't know where exactly, we don't know exactly who, but somebody had roughly this conversation. They said, imagine. Imagine if we open our border with East Germany, and then they come in one door, and then we open our border with Austria, and they go out the other door into the free world. We could bring down the Berlin Wall. Mm -hmm. Somebody had a conversation, something like that. Unfortunately, we know from the 9-11 Commission that another conversation happened in Kandahar, Afghanistan around the year 1999. Someone said, you know, imagine if we could fly a fully loaded 757 and hit the World Trade Center between the 96th and 97th floor. We could bring it down. And so it was using the same technology in many ways, um, same platform, but two competing, totally different forms of imagination. Now, it sounds ludicrous even to say this, but, but you really have to say it. In this flattened world, what individuals imagine becomes really important because individuals can do so much good and so much harm now as individuals on this platform and how we get more people to have a more positive progressive sharing imagination concern you know for the poor and and uh, uh things we've been talking about tonight that's a real challenge i don't have the answer to that but i do know one thing we the united states have the biggest responsibility for setting the right example. And if there's one thing that disappoints me in the last few years is that we haven't been the best country we can be. I'm, I'm going to ask Joe Stiglitz to, to respond to that. But would whoever the next questioner or commenter is going to be come up to one of these mics. Forgive me, but I need to move sure, it along no, just a little bit. Go no, ahead, I agree Joe. with your last point. One of the ways of seeing the, the point you raised is that Marcus Sen talks about the fact that most famines, or almost all famines, do not occur because of lack of food. It's the distribution of food. And that's the same thing about the, available re uh, the ability of the world to produce resources. The, that's not the issue. The issue is, in some sense, making sure that the technology gets transferred, that the capital gets transferred, uh, and that the food, the other resources get distributed. 
And that is a question of, in many, to, many, uh, to a great extent, politics, the way we organize our societies. Take one example that yeah, you didn't raise, but one which uh, I've been, you know, a lot of people are very concerned about global warming. Uh, if uh, everybody continues, if everybody in the world were to use, uh, uh, emit greenhouse gases, uh, pollute at the rate of Americans, the world is doomed. Uh, we can't uh, almost surely do that. We have the technology to, uh, to, to emit much less. There are other advanced industrial countries that per capita, or per dollar GDP, that emit half a third of the amount that we do. So it's clearly possible, it's technologically possible, it's engineeringly possible, but it is a question of a will. It's not a question of imagination, I argue. It is a really question of how those decisions get made who is making the decisions? If you have an energy lobby making these decisions, you're going to make different decisions about conservation than you do if you are some of the people who are going to be put under the water in Bangladesh as a result of global warming. Joe, stay on that point for a moment, because um, the United States, which has roughly 5% of the world's population, consumes approximately 25% of the world's oil and gas. Right? That's right. Roughly, roughly 20 million barrels a day. That's right. Um, the question that was raised before is really a political question as much as anything else. Exactly. If, if we, as the world's leading democracy, cannot find a way to share equitably, uh, what chance is there of it happening anywhere else? I mean, you can well understand the Chinese and the Indians saying, wait a second, it's our turn. We want a piece of this. And folks like Hugo Chavez, who are saying, eh, that's not such a bad idea. Maybe Venezuela will sign some big deal with China. This may become one of the key political issues of our time. I, I think that's right. And I think maybe the reality of that will bring uh, 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 a change in policy, uh, maybe with a change in administration. But you know, the, the point that Tom made so forcefully a, little, a minute ago, uh, that because of our lack of conservation, and to a large extent, prices are higher, those high prices are feeding the people who are the source of the problem. If we had conservation, not only would it be good for the global environment and save people like Bangladesh who will be underwater, but it would also do probably more for democracy than any other policy you could think of. Let's go to another question.